Thomas Gent, wonderful to see you in your air-conditioned cab on one of the hottest, if not the hottest, day of uh, 2021 to date. Uh, and I think some of the stuff we'll be talking about will be about some of the agricultural solutions to um, uh, the climate emergency. Just, But just before we start, where are you and, and what exactly are you doing, apart from sitting in an air-conditioning cab? <laughs> yeah, no, it says it's, it's 31 degrees on my tractor, so yeah, it's oh. very hot. Um, so, um, yeah, so I'm in South Lincolnshire, I'm in the UK, sort of very near Peterborough. Yeah. Um, our, our farm is in the very flat fens, sort of around the wash area. Say a little bit about the farm, because it's a family-owned um, farm, at least originally. How did, how did that come about? Yeah, so, um, yeah, family farm. We've been farming in a regenerative, sustainable way here for about 12 years-ish. Um, so the farm, yeah, the farm has you know, developed over a long period. Um, my, I believe my great granddad kind of started farming after the after the Second World War, yeah. um, and then and then it's basically yeah he started with a few fields and it's grown, you know, quite steadily since then. Um, granddad grew it a lot. He was a very ambitious person and um, and borrowed a lot of money to make it grow, um, which obviously paid off really well. And then yeah, granddad and then dad's sort of taken on the next the next stage and looking to sort of partner with other local farms and push our farming practice out there, I suppose. And and now called uh, Gentle Farming, how did that branding come about? So I started Gentle Farming um, about a year ago, really, in the first yeah. stop, which was kind of this time last year. Um, I started it because I wanted to support and promote regenerative farming, essentially. It's a bit of an interesting story, actually. I, I, <laughs> I, I, took, I was taking some grain um, into one of our grain buyers, um, which we do very regularly um, yeah. and I was I tipped it in a, a very big grain store um, on top of some other on, on top of some other wheat as as per normal essentially but on this occasion I just happened to pass one of our neighboring farmers who kind of was coming in after me to tip on the same heap and you know cover our wheat up essentially um, and I know him you know he's a local farmer he's a very nice man but he does not farm in a regenerative way he farms in a very conventional you know maximum cultivation lots of fertilizer type way um and i just thought it really struck me at that moment that i just thought this is so crazy how can my product be tipped in that same heap and you know valued at the same price as as somebody producing it in a completely different way to me against all the principles i kind of believe in i guess yeah. um so that really started me on the journey of trying to find a way to differentiate regenerative agriculture and that's kind of led me to start in gentle farming um and yeah, obviously we've grown and changed since then. I think we'll talk about that as we go, I suppose. <laughs> well, I think one of the things that uh, particularly struck me when I first came across uh, what you were doing was that part of your, in a sense, business model is selling carbon credits for the carbon taken from the atmosphere and stored in the soil and hopefully maintained uh, over time. But just before we go to that side of what you're doing, um, talk a little bit about your particular approach to regenerative farming, which involves no-till um, uh, cultivation. Um, how did that begin and what does that involve for those who haven't come across it? Yeah, so one of the kind of, I would say one of the core principles of regenerative farming is to disturb the soil as little as possible. Yeah. Um, and obviously to do that, you know, we still got to plant the crop, so we've still got to get some seeds in the ground. So what we use is a it's a machine often called a direct drill or a no-till drill. Um, but what it means is that we plant the seeds directly into the stubble or the, the residues from the previous crop. Um, so, yeah, my basically when we started farming regeneratively on our farm about 12 years ago-ish, dad and granddad um, was basically, we was at a stage where we was farming, we thought that we was farming very conventionally. Um, and we was at a stage where a lot of our machinery was getting very old. Yeah. Um, and dad and granddad either had a decision to make, invest a lot of money in brand new machinery and carry on eventually farming how we always were. Or there was this new thing called no-till farming, um, which which seemed a bit crazy at the time. Um, probably it is still a bit crazy, um, but it was kind of the new thing they wanted to try. So, yeah, for, for, for reasons, you know, a lot of a lot of reasons, really, they decided to try this. Um, and what they did was they sold every piece of kind of heavy cultivation equipment we had. They bought one no-till direct drill, um, and that and that was it. People, we was kind of doing it whether people liked it or not, essentially. Um, 
and you know it's developed and changed in the 12 years since then and we've learned a lot but essentially what it means is that we plant seeds in a way that doesn't disturb the surface um and you know if you was driving past it you might not even be able to tell that we've drilled the field um because the stubble and the residue would still be there from the previous crop in some ways no tilling um cultivation has quite a long history i mean i remember uh, when the well i wasn't around when the dust bowl hit the united states but um part of the conservation agriculture that followed on from that was uh, contour farming and um, no-till uh, cultivation as well. So were you aware of that long history? Is that you, did you sort of learn from that? You did mention in an earlier conversation that your grandfather uh, has, has been something of an inventor and came up with some uh, particular approach to all of this. So how did all of that happen? Yeah, so granddad's always been a, um, a bit of a crazy inventor, I suppose. <laughs> Um, in the in the past, he developed sort of you know when when we was all farming conventionally, he had developed quite a um, well 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 known and well sold piece of con, um, cultivation equipment, um, which you know it, essentially it made quite a bit of money and it, it's how we bought quite a lot of our farm really. Yeah. Um, but now you know and since then he's always been inventing and trying new crazy ideas, um, and that was kind of the first success he had. And now in the recent I'd say the recent sort of four or five years, he's had a, a, a growing a next success, which is a which is a sort of a specific um, cut, uh, no-till drill system. Um, and the important bit is when we when we plant the seed, we plant it at, a, at an angle like that, which mm -hmm. which means that there's much less soil disturbance and it's much easier to pull through the ground essentially. So we use a lot less diesel. Um, but yeah, he's always been kind of interested in developing these things. And now we've got this 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 um, invention which is, is selling all over the world. Um, but the interesting thing, because it's selling all over the world, we get a lot of kind of interesting conversations and contacts with, you know, a lot of other countries. And yeah, absolutely. Like in North America, they've, you know, the Dust Bowl was a, was a major issue at the time. And I guess it still is. So they, they yeah. were practicing some sort of um, no-till cultivations back then. And they still have, they still are essentially, because their soils are not as good quality as UK soils. Yeah. Um, their, their soils degraded faster. Um, and whenever that was in the past, I don't know when the dust bowl was, but whenever that was, that was when their soils started to be, you know, started to sh really show the, you know, what had happened and what effect, you know, degrading yeah. the soil had ha had had. Um, and in the UK, we was you know carrying on plowing because we hadn't seen any of those negative effects yet. Because our soil quality was so good, we could carry on; everything was fine. But definitely now, farmers in the UK are starting to see that. Um, and I think if we just carried on conventionally, you know, within the next probably thirty or forty years, then you know we'd have the same sort of situation as they had over here. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, I think uh, you know the Dust Bowl uh, was at its peak in the sort of twenties and. 30s, early 40s, but um, and part of the problem there was the ploughing up of the prairie uh, grass, pet prairie sod, and so on, and just in the end, a lot of it blowing away in the wind, and the crops were wrong. I mean, they used things like cotton, which are pretty greedy uh, plants. But um, one of the the inputs that no-till cultivation depends on is a herbicide, and and I, typically, I think that's glyphosate or, or Roundup. That's not always been a popular um, uh, herbicide. <laughs> so tell me about the balancing act there in, in terms of do we, don't we? Uh, if we do, how do we use it? Yeah, it's a super interesting one. So so no-till farming um, absolutely uses chemicals. Um, we're not shy of that. Um, absolutely use a huge amount less chemicals than a conventional farm because yeah. the soil quality is so much more healthy. Essentially, the soil is giving us a lot a lot that we, you know, that we used to get from a can, we get from the soil organically now. Um, but we still have to use some. And the, the interesting one is glyphosate. You know, there's been a lot of bad press. A lot of people are quite annoyed about glyphosate. But what it does allow us to do is farm no-till because the major issue in a in a no-till system or, or any farming system really is to control the weeds. Yeah. So in a in an organic system, Obviously, they don't have glyphosate. So what they have to do is plough the fields and cultivate them to be able to destroy those plants, you know, those weeds. Yeah. Um, which is, you know, obviously that's, you know, that's the way they do it. They don't want to use glyphosate. Absolutely fine. But what that means is as soon as they're cultivating the soil, they're going against all the principles that I hold dearly, which is yeah. we need to keep the soil structure. We need to keep the carbon in the soil. We need to build the soil structure. We need to keep the organic matter there, all those kind of things. As soon as you go in there with any sort of cultivation equipment, then you're going to destroy that. 
So glyphosate, you know, it allows us to use a massively less diesel because we don't have yeah. to cultivate the soils. It allows us to keep the soils there, allows us to add more carbon into the soils, all those kind of things. It is a necessity at the moment in no-till yeah. systems. We all accept the holy grail is organic no-till. Yeah. <laughs> um, but I don't think, you know, nobody's got there. there. I know quite a few farmers in the UK that have kind of got trials and trying to make it work, different ideas to make it work. I think we'll get there. Yeah. Um, but right now, it, yeah, this is, this is where we're at to produce food, essentially. We need well, to use very, it very helpful. And, and um, you've mentioned diesel a couple of times. Uh, do you use biodiesel or is that still a distant prospect? Yeah, so we don't actually use biodiesel here. Um, it, we have, do have a bit of biodiesel as a percentage within the diesel, um, but no. The interesting thing is, so this is a really rough average, but kind of on a no-till farm, you're using about 30 litres a hectare of diesel. Yeah. Um, but on a conventional farm where you might be ploughing or whatever, you're going to be using over 120, 150 litres a hectare. So you know, that's a, that's some huge amount of difference yeah. in terms of the amount of diesel we're using um, and how sustainable we can be. And that kind of just shows what little we're doing to the soil um, just because we're burning that less diesel. Well, you, you've touched a number of times on the, the importance of soil structure for, you know, the extent, the health of the soil, the extent to which it can capture and store and hold on to carbon. Talk a little bit, if you will, about how you approach that and and you're working with a Danish uh, company, Commodity Carbon. How, how did that come about as well? Yeah, absolutely. So yeah, going back to uh, my little story of, um, of, of, um, of tipping the wheat in the same heap and wanting to yes. different regenerative products. Um, basically, yeah, like I sort of set myself the goal. I want to sort of find a way to differentiate our regenerative products. And very quickly, I kind of gone down the route of, you know, soil carbon, everybody was talking about it. Everybody still is talking about it, really. Um, and there seemed to be a, quite a big opportunity in it. You know, a lot of these businesses, you know, need to find ways to support local carbon offsetting projects. They need to yeah. offset some of their emissions. And I knew, in theory, we was putting some carbon in our soils because my organic matter figures were going up. Um, so I was a bit bored in the first lockdown. So I kind of set myself the challenge to see if I could monetize that or quantify it in any way. Um and I basically spent the last year trying to find an actual real life practical way to do that on the ground. Yeah. And I tried loads of things, loads of different ideas, loads of different systems, loads of wacky ideas. And I've you know, learned a lot, made a lot of mistakes. But yeah, we're getting there. But now kind of at the start of this year, sort of January time, um, I started working with Commodity Carbon, which are a Danish agri-tech startup company, essentially. Um, and they developed this soil carbon certification system and they basically didn't not have any knowledge of the UK market or UK farmer or anything like that. So I worked with them to be able to tweak their system to fit a UK farmer and also to, to market it in the UK, essentially. Yeah. Um, so how their system works is, you know, a farmer goes on and inputs all their information about what they're doing in their field. Um, and we can quantify the amount of carbon they're going to be putting in that soil. Um, and produce a certified soil carbon offset that you know a, a corporate or a company can then buy to offset some of their emissions. Um, the really interesting thing about this is it really starts to promote this way of farming, um, and it gives the farmers that are very skeptical of it a real kind of business case to be able to say, you know, I should transform and I should try this new thing. Well, hopefully, um, and and one of the things that you mentioned in an, in an earlier conversation was that. Um, you know, post Brexit, many farmers are having to struggle a bit. Uh, many of them having voted perhaps for Brexit, but nonetheless, um, things are changing, and 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 the the carbon capture and storage piece of all of this um, could actually be a way of bridging some of the the, the 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 gaps. I mean, what sort of response have you had from other farmers? Not necessarily your your problematic neighbour, perhaps, but. Um, are people open or are they seeing this as a sort of foreign intrusion in a way? No, oh, absolutely. Um, it's definitely a hot topic at the minute, so mm. carbon offset in, in, the, in, in the farming world. We all, like, we all know in theory it's possible. You know, in theory we are putting carbon in the soil, in theory companies want to buy it. But making that a kind of a practical reality and a system that's easy for farmers to use, that's the challenge. Yeah. Um, the ease of use and the scalability is the challenging bit, I guess. 
um, and the certification level that we've got now. But yeah, farmers are very, very keen to do this and they're very, very keen to be part of it and help. Um, but <laughs> I would say, you know, the farmers that we're speaking to at the minute, are, you know, the farmers like me, the farmers that have already slides down this route or looking down this route or, you know, whatever, got, you know, thinking they're going to kind of look into this area. The interesting one in the future is how how does this affect, you know, farmers that are not, you know, completely conventional farmers? Yeah. How does it hurt them in the future? And that comes down back to that BPS thing, which is the basic payment scheme we used to get from the EU. Obviously, now we've left the EU. Um that we're losing that essentially um it's going to be phased out in the next four years i think um and, and the government are saying they're going to give us some public money for public good um we're not nobody's really sure what that means but um, <laughs> it'll be good um th but i think the thing we all the thing farmers all know is you know the uk government is not going to have as much money as the eu government used to give yeah. us um so farmers need to find a way to be able to deliver that public good from the private sector um, and soil carbon offsets kind of fit that bill absolutely perfectly, really. That's very, I mean, that's very interesting. One of the things that strikes me is that you've been quite successful in uh, promoting, communicating what you've been doing, the media and, 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 and people, not just the Farmers Weekly, but have been picking up on that and well done with that. But what's the balance between, I mean, many people who have a business proposition that they think is going to be successful hold it very close to their chest because they want to uh, this to succeed before the uh, the competition sort of gets wise and, and 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 does the same. But you seem to be almost on a campaign. You, I'm, it's a loaded word, but not missionary. But I mean, you 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 seem to want to get the story out there. Why? What's driving that? Farmers need to change. Farmers need to start doing, start thinking about their soil. And absolutely a lot of farmers are, but there's a lot of farmers that aren't. Yeah. Um, and I kind of, you know, if I can encourage more farmers to be regenerative in whatever way I can, then I'm going to be happy with that. That's kind of where I'm coming from, I guess. Um, and the more kind of public attention we get on this and the more people start to talk about it, then the more interested farmers get. And hopefully they start to, you know, ask questions. How can my farm do a bit of that? Or what, you know, what ideas have they got that I might be able to use on my farm? Yeah. Um, so I guess it's that. It's not really a competitive thing. It's just I want more farmers to be regenerative. How can we do that? That's, that was, I guess that's my only thought, really. The question in all of this is, and at what point do supermarkets and retailers and consumers wake up to this? And, and how would you imagine? I mean, you said earlier on you were slightly uh, sceptical about some aspects of the organic agriculture uh, movement. Um, how is this best going to be communicated to ordinary people going into uh, you know retail environments is that certification and labeling or, or what a lot of these corporates are setting very ambitious sort of net zero targets yeah. um and especially the retailers a lot of their you know scope free emissions or predominantly all their scope free emissions are from agriculture and so they they absolutely see that they need to help and be part of this kind of transformation to make farming more sustainable and more you know essentially carbon zero um but yeah, like how we need to communicate it in the right way. Um, and I, I guess I, I, you know, I hope in the end it becomes the norm. And this yeah. is just that we all do it and we don't need to communicate it because that's just how it is. <laughs> but there's a, lot, there's, a long, there's a long way to go in that. Um, yeah, that seems like a generational time scale. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> but there's definitely opportunity. I would say there's opportunity to, for farmers in the meantime. To, to, you know, I think we should be pay, getting paid more and getting or a premium or a certain yeah. market. The produce that we produce because it has this story and you know net zero and all that kind of stuff is massively important uh, and we know you know my generation the millennial generation are you know it's what their top priority is climate change and you know companies corporate retailers absolutely know that and any way they can do to support that and show that um that you know they're interested to, to find out about i guess no, that's that, that's great. And I suppose a final, final question, if I may. Um, you followed your grandfather, you followed your father, and no doubt people in the family before that were in farming. A lot of people who've been in farming are finding it quite difficult. Each week I watch BBC's Countryfile program, and it's very aspirational now. If people want to come into farming, finding it difficult to find places. Why do you think people either ought to stay in farming or come into it. I mean, what, what is it that motivates you? Why don't you go off and become an aerospace or digital entrepreneur or something like that? 
I think we've always seen farming or the public or everybody has always seen farming as a very specialist and a very sort of niche thing, I guess. I, my belief is it's just a business, right? It's, yeah. it's a business like any other business. And we need to kind of remember that, you know, it, it's a business that can deliver a lot of good. Um, well, just like any business can really. Yeah. Um, but I, I personally am massively interested in kind of the business aspect rather than the like actual farming, but obviously like it all is wrapped into one. Um, but yeah, like I don't think I could think of a better job, really. You know, like well, right, right now I'm in the sun, I'm in the tractor, I've got my dog on my feet. You know, it's, it's like, <laughs> um, it's yeah, it's a great way of life, and definitely we need more people to come into farming. And there's so much opportunity coming in the next, the next four or five years is going to be absolutely, you know, it's going to be so much happening, so much fast paced, there's so much opportunity to kind of make farming and food better. Um, and there's never been as much interest as there has been up till now in it, you know, following the COVID and everybody's interested in their local nature and all that kind of thing. You know, the time is now. We need people to come, young people, and come and come and work with us and come and talk to me. I'm sure you've got some crazy ideas I'd love to help with. <laughs> that's, that's wonderful. And I, you know, I hope that a growing, a big and growing uh, proportion of those people will think very much along the lines that you're uh, thinking now. You've got a harvest coming on fairly imminently, I think. So <laughs> yeah, well, like, yeah. Well, some people have started. We we're, we're sort of thinking maybe next week or the week after. Um, but yeah, it's it's always a busy time of year. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank thanks for squeezing this in ahead of that. Good luck with it all, and good luck with the broader mission, Thomas. I think this is immensely exciting, and we'll uh, track you with great interest over time. Thanks again for yeah, being part of this. No worries. Thanks for talking to me. <laughs>